So let me take this opportunity to give you a brief introduction to our chair, Professor Shomnath Bhattacharya. So he is in charge of the Crop Research Unit and a professor at Bidhan Chandra Krishi Vishwavidyalaya, West Bengal. He is a member of the Indian Society of Genetics and Plant Breeding, fellow of West Bengal Academy of Science and Technology. He did his PhD in the development of rice and lentil varieties with adaptive pl uh, plasticity from the Department of Biochemistry, Bose Institute, Kolkata. He worked on the development of rice and lentil varieties with adaptive uh, plasticity through mass and uh, mutation breeding, identifying superior alleles improve uh, fitness in Eastern India, especially West Bengal. And also, he was involved in identification and use of allele-specific markers in rice and lentil breeding programs. He has over 135 publications in re renowned journals. And I would request our Honorable Vice-Chancellor, Sir, Professor Drubhujyoti Chattopadhyay, and Professor Ashok Ranjan Thakur, and Professor Orun Lahiri Mojumdar, Sir, to please come up on the dais and felicitate our Chair, Professor Shumnath Bhattacharya. Now let me introduce you to our co-chair, Professor Shampadash. She is an Indian biotechnologist scientist and an expert on public sector agricultural biotechnology. She's a fellow of Indian National Science Acad Academy and National Academy of Sciences India. Currently, she's a senior professor in the Division of Plant Biology at Bose Institute, Kolkata. Working under the supervision of Professor S.K. Sen of Bose Institute, uh, Ma'am received her doctorate degree in 1981. She has been working with national and international individuals studying the mechanism of plant defense responses against pests and pathogens with an aim to combat their stress. She did her postdoctoral training at the Friedrich Maisha Institute in Switzerland, where she became interested in plant transformation, including rice, mustard, and tomatoes. Her research at Bose has included isolation, characterization, and monitoring the functionality of insecticidal proteins from plant sources. She has studied expression of agronomically important genes in crop plants. So without further ado, I would request our uh, Vice Chancellor, Sir, Professor Dhruvajati Chattopadhyay, Professor Ashok Ranjan Thakur, Mentor, uh, Vice Chancellor SNU, and uh, Professor Urun Lahiri Mojumdar to kindly felicitate Shampa, ma'am. Thank you so much. Let's now move on to the technical session and continue with the invited lectures. everybody. So now the speaker is Dr. Ashish Ranjan, another speaker from NIPGR. So today's third speaker is Ashish Ranjan. He is also from NIPGR. Again, his bio sketch is on the screen. So, Ashish BSc from BHU and then MSc from NRCP BIRI 
and then PhD also from there. And, oh no, PhD from Max Planck Institute, yes, really. So then uh, after postdoc at California, UC Davis, California, for four years or so, he did postdoc and then joined as a staff scientist at NIPGR. Now he has been promoted to level five. Okay, so he is, uh, his topic is, topic is, photosynthetic efficiency. Photosynthesis at the interface of leaf developmental features, a genomic perspective. So now a new type of research he is doing. So welcome, Ashish. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, you ma'am, and thank you, uh, sir, for chairing and co-chairing this session and uh, moving from the underground to above ground, from the root to leaf. First of all, good morning to every one of you. And uh, I would like to thank organizers for giving me opportunity to talk or discuss something with the students on this platform. So as the title says, I'll be talking about the leaf development and photosynthesis. But before I come to my talk, uh, I, I've seen the students' reluctancy in the students in asking questions. So I'm going to ask questions. I'm beginning, to, beginning my talk asking questions to the students. And let's see if they give answer, if not questions. So it's not questions. It's like, as a plant, I mean, you are all science student. What I want to know, what fascinates you all the most in plants? What do you find most interesting in the plant? I just want a couple of responses. Five seconds, raise your hands. Five seconds, raise your hands, any students. What fascinates you see plants all around you? No response? Then I will tell mine. <laughs> students. <laughs> Ah, plants are not fascinating as students. I'm not talking scientists. I'm taking answers from students. <laughs> yes, please. Plants can, uh, yeah. uh, plants can uh, produce oxygen, which is life-saving for all human beings, mm -hmm. uh, which is pretty fascinating. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, um, plants are, uh, a lot of plants are the source of uh, nutrition and uh, for human beings as well. Wonderful. Any other comments from students? Any more comments? So exactly the same thing fascinates all, us also. One of the things that we are fascinated uh, as a group is photosynthesis, the basic plant, biotechnology, uh, basic plant biology process. Photosynthesis is the key process that gives us everything that we eat. Right? Directly or indirectly, we are getting everything from the photosynthesis. I wish we could photosynthesize. Feeling hungry, go in sun, come back full and start working again. Right? Not possible. At least for next few decades, that's not practically possible. But what we could do using the genetics and genomics as well as biotechnological intervention, we can try to make plants photosynthesize more. That's one aspect of the plants. I will come back to that thing later. The another fascinating aspects about the plant is their amazing ability to survive under adverse climatic conditions. We are privileged. Very hot, get AC. Very cold, wear warm clothes. Plants are not that, you know, privileged. But they have adaptability. They have certain mechanism to adapt their adverse climatic conditions. So that's another fascinating aspect. And we are trying to, as a group, we are trying to touch both of these aspects in our lab. Uh, that I will come one after the other, primarily photosynthesis today. So oh, yesterday and this morning, we have seen wonderful talks talking about the plants, basic fundamental aspect as well as application oriented. All the talks that we have seen, the, base, the theme of all these or ultimate interest is plant performance. We want to make plant perform better. We want to plants to give us more, right? And whatever plant performance, crop yield or biomass that you see, this is a function of basically developmental and physiological attributes. Plant developmental features, determine the physiological outcome. Similarly, depending upon the physiological needs, there is an adaptation in the developmental feature. So simplistic, simplistic 
picture, developmental and physiology coordinate to give the plant performance. But this has astounding complexity of genetics, genomics, biochemistry, molecular biology underlying. And this is what we have to di dissect as a plant scientist. This doesn't stop here. It gets complicated. Rather, it gets interesting because there are a lot of environmental challenges that just, just we are talking that plants are exposed to. And plant has to show the developmental and physiological plasticity to the environmental challenges. We have touched on few of these aspects a few fewer ago in a review the, uh, in the development that we write, wrote that developmental features that would optimize the physiological outcome getting to the biomass and yield. And these developmental features are then under the control of genes and hormones and the environmental factors. What we specifically work in the lab when we talk about the physiology, precisely photosynthesis. What are the variations in the photosynthesis we see? And what are the developmental attributes? What are the developmental features that could be targeted for increasing photosynthesis? Then we also look for the genetic regulation of those desirable leaf developmental features that could be used to increase photosynthetic efficiency. On top of that, we look for the environmental regulation particularly light and temperature regulation of leaf developmental features that will eventually um, impact the physiological outcome. Today I'll be mostly talking about the photosynthesis variation and the genetic regulation of leaf developmental features. The first and foremost question comes, why photosynthesis? There are so many things. We already talk, uh, discussed that photosynthesis is the key process that gives us food that we eat. What is surprising, we have seen the unprecedented increase in the crop yield during the green revolution and subsequent breeding practices. But what is surprising, there has been limited increase in the photosynthetic uh, efficiency of the crop plants during the green revolution, after, or during the green revolution and afterwards also. So the basic questions that we are asking, can photosynthesis be turbocharged uh, for higher yields? Now, if we want to increase the photosynthetic efficiency, we need to understand how photosynthesis works. Photosynthesis, basically three things. First, or basically two parts. One, light harvesting, which generates electron. Electron, that electron transport chain uh, delivers that reducing power for the CO2 assimilation. So two, two major component, photochemical traits. We could try to increase the photochemical efficiency, photochemical traits for increasing photosynthetic efficiency. The other part is biochemical traits, CO2 assimilation. Now, everything of these is taking place inside the leaf. So the question is that can we optimize the leaf developmental traits? Because CO2 has to enter into the leaf. Light needs to be harvested by the leaf. Can leaf morphological or anatomical traits be optimized for increasing photosynthetic efficiency? Fine. So this is the question. Now, are there examples that leaf development has been changed for increasing photosynthetic efficiency or increasing CO2 assimilation? Can anyone tell me, can any st student tell me that do you find any example in the nature in your textbook where you see higher photosynthetic efficiency or higher CO2 assimilation efficiency in some specific type of plants? Any, any answer from students? Yeah, I am seeing some noise. Tell loudly. Tell loudly. I have already heard the answer, C4, right? So C4 is one of the examples. Example, natural evolution for the higher photosynthetic efficiency and a specific developmental feature, crange anatomy. I will not go into that detail. But that is known, that is given to us by the nature. Crange anatomy, developmental feature, more CO2 assimilation, more photosynthetic efficiency. Can't we use this in the other plant? People have tried. Rice, the plant that we eat is C3 plant. So people have, hundreds of scientists globally have tried with a lot of funding to make C3 plants do C4 photosynthesis. But so far there is no success in that direction because of developmental, biochemical, uh, developmental, so we have, we have to bring crank anatomy, biochemical, they are certain specific enzyme and evolutionary these plants C3, C4 are very diff different. So what is the alternative? If we cannot make rice do C4 photosynthesis, what could be the alternative that we uh, could increase the rice photosynthetic efficiency? 
Any guess? Any guess from the students? Any guess? So, what we could do, we could look for the variation in the rice itself because it's possible that in the rice system itself there are some varieties or some relatives, wild relatives, they are photosynthesizing more. And see what is different there genetically or biochemically or uh, at the molecular level that is making them photosynthesize more. So, what we could do, we could look for the natural variation in the rice system itself for the photosynthesis. What is supporting this idea? That these are all the cultivated rice variety. Variety. You see the difference in the biomass. They are different in the biomass. Now, this is also inclusion of a few wild relatives of rice. Lot of biomass. So they show remarkable variation in the, uh, you know, uh, biomass. This is the point that we started. We took some of the wild and cultivated rice, like this one. Here you see these two are the rice. This is IR64 variety that we eat rice. This is the Japonica rice Nippon beer for which genome sequence is available. These three are the wild rice, Rupi Pogon, Latifolia and Australensis. And this is a rice which grows in Africa. You see remarkable variation in the biomass. When we put these plants in the field, people ask us that you have put sugarcane or maize in your field. They are that tall. Okay. So we started quantifying photosynthesis of all these plants that were showing the difference in the biomass. What we found that this green uh, uh, color indicates the wild rice. What you see, some of the wild rice has very high photosynthesis compared to the yellow colored cultivated rice. Fine. Then, basically, what we, what we are measuring here for in the photosynthesis, which is missing a little bit missing uh, part, we are measuring the amount of CO2 assimilated per unit leaf area per second, because CO2 is being used in the photosynthesis. And that is a final readout that is dependent upon a lot of physiological underlines. Uh, so we quantified a number of physiological uh, underlines, uh, underpinnings like stomatal conductance, carboxylation efficiency, CO2 concentration, intercellular CO2 concentration, chlorophyll content. All, all of this seems to be high in this wild rice with high photosynthesis rate. Now, the point here, high photosynthesis in this wild rice, low photosynthesis in this cultivated rice. So something is limiting photosynthesis in these cultivated rice compared to the wild rice. What could be the, those limitations, limitations? Going back again to the basics of the photosynthesis from the textbook. Photochemistry, biochemistry. Photochemistry means light harvesting which generates electron trans, electron. And biochemistry means the Rubisco activity. To measure limitation could be limitations of electron transport rate or limitations of the Rubisco activity. And fortunately, we have models to check it. So FDCV model that generates A by C. CI is a different CO2 concentration, A is photosynthesis. We model this and try to find out what is limiting in the photosynthesis. So these two are the wild rice. This VC max indicates Rubisco activity and J max indicates the electron transported. What we see in this wild rice, higher value of VC max and J max compared to the cultivated rice means Photosynthesis in this cultivated rice are limited because of both Rubisco activity and electron transport rate. And that we have experimentally, I will not show those results, but we have validated that exp uh, in experimentally in the field grown plants. Fine. Now, we wanted to come to the development because, okay, photochemistry, this uh, really is interesting that uh, if, if there is an influence of developmental features on that. We started looking for the developmental differences of these wild, wild and cultivated rice. Wild rice, wider leaf, and much thicker leaf compared to the cultivated rice. Thicker leaf means more photosynthetic masonry per unit area. We further went now, photosynthesis takes place in the mesophyll. Mesophyll uh, is the site of photo. So we started looking in this wild rice. They have larger mesophyll cell and more lobed mesophyll cell. More lobed mesophyll cells means more surface area for diffusion of CO2. And then eventually for light harvesting, chloroplast surface area should be exposed. And they also have more chloroplast, bigger chloroplast nicely organized along the cell wall of the mesophyll cells. So now the key factor for mesophyll is the surface area exposed to intercellular space which is available for CO2 diffusion or surface area of the chloroplast which is exposed to the intercellular space for the, uh, you know, uh, harvesting light. 
So we quantified those. So this is mesophyll surface area exposed to interstellar space, and this is chloroplast area. Both are higher in this wild rice compared to the cultivated rice. So we did some other uh, expression analysis and all. I will not go into detail. I'll quickly summarize this part. And what I want to say that we have photosynthetically wild rice available that could be captured, that could be used for increasing photosynthetic efficiency. What is leading their high photosynthesis is certain developmental features, thicker and wider leaves, thicker leaves with more mesophyll cells. And also the mesophyll cells are larger and lobed with much more chloroplast into it. This paper was published. We can go into the details uh, in this paper. So these three people who did this uh, work. Now, from here, we have picked on two developmental traits. Because we are talking about the surface area of the mesophyll cells and the photosynthetic machinery per unit leaf area. So we have picked two traits, thickness, leaf thickness, important. Not always. Environmental condition, you have, if you have sufficient of light, leaf thickness is very good. If you have rice limited, thickness of leaf is not good. But assuming that everything is perfect, thick, thickness of the leaf would have more photosynthetic machinery. Then lobed mesophyll cell, more surface area exposed to the uh, intercellular space. How can we get to the genes of regulating these traits? Before, I will come back to this in just a second. But before that, any one of you can ask me, why are you looking just for the, in the, in the, in the wild rice? Why are you not looking in the cultivated rice? We have so many varieties growing all over the India. In fact, India has 13,000, more th than 13,000 rice land races available. Why are you not looking at the variation in those, uh, all those varieties cultivated that grows in the farmer's field? We did that also. So in that, we found we have taken the selective, selected land races as well as rice 3K panel, which has genotyped at the ED Philippines. And we saw the photosynthetic variation ranging from 2 to 31 micromoles CO2 per meter square per second. Here, we are fortunate. We are fortunate that we have genotype that are also available. So we have phenotype. These are all other phenotypic traits that I'm not uh, this, uh, explaining. But here we have phenotype data. We have genotype data, which is marker. We could associate phenotype with the genotype to find out which loci is actually giving uh, or controlling the photosynthetic efficiency. Genome-wide association study. We did genome-wide association study with this, all this cultivated rice variety. We found photosynthetic, a few loci very strongly associated with the photosynthetic efficiency. We selected this one initially to look for on the chromosome one. And we, so, we saw how variable the marker or genotype is across the different existence varying in the phenotype of, for the photosynthesis. What was interesting, we found various haplotypes. Haplotypes means the blocks of the uh, uh, DNA fragment varying from one organism to one variety to other. In the haplotypes, we see three major haplotypes. These two are almost same, and haplotype three is very different com compared to these two haplotypes. And the haplotype three, when you see, they, these, uh, the varieties in these haplotype three has lower photosynthesis rate and all other parameters lower than the haplotype two and haplotype two. So there is something in that reason in the haplotype three, which is limiting photosynthesis. We are looking into this gene. We know a few genes there. We are trying to functionally characterize this thing. So what I wanted to say, we are not just focusing on the cultivated, uh, wild cultivated, but also jivas with the another approach, jivas uh, with the cultivated rice. Now coming back to the while cultivated that I was talking. Couple of traits we have identified. How can, first the thing that we asked even, we can get to the genes using this wild cultivated system. We didn't know because wild cultivated are very different from each other. Right, so before these traits come recently when we have done all this analysis. Before that itself we are trying to establish that is it possible to identify genes. And these wild cultivators are different. So this we know the mesophyll and the leaf thickness difference now. We are following it. We have very good leads. But what I'll be, what we started, just trying to find the genes that regulate the morphological variation, leaf size, using the cultivated and wild rice. What you see, that wild rice has longer leaves, much bigger leaves. Similarly, early, early leaves. What we asked, what are the regulators for the leaf size using this wild cultivated system? But you clearly see that longer leaf, fine. So something in this rice, Australensis or Glabrima, making these leaves grow bigger. What is the way? We did not know. 
So one is looking into the gene expression. Transcriptomics, very common, everyone does that. We also did that. What was in our interest? To look into the genes which are specific to these accessions. So in that, these are gene clusters which are expressed together. Here, Australensis, Glabrima, IR64, Nipponvir, four varieties, two cultivated, two wild rice. What we are interested in, the wild rice. Yellow means high expression of these genes. So this is the genes expressed high level at Glabrima, high level in Australensis, and high level in Australensis and Glabrima. So these genes are high ex highly expressed in the leaves, developing leaves of these wild rice. How can we get to the genes? We started exploring these genes, what are there? Made gene, net, gene expression network, how the gene expression is connected. I will not go into detail. If someone is interested, I can talk uh, to that uh, student later. But we just wanted to see what are the gene regulatory, what are there in the gene regulatory network. What we found, mm -hmm. expectedly, leaf size, so cell cycle, were there gibberellic acid signaling and gibberellic acid biosynthesis genes were there. And some transcription factors. So our working hypothesis happened, GA, cell cycle, and transcription factor may coordinate to regulate the leaf size. We started checking. If we asked, we thought this indicated that GA could be the causal. So then we quantified the GA across a number of varieties. What we saw, wherever longer leaves in the wild rice, more GA content. Lesser, uh, a smaller leaf, less GA content. Very strong correlation of the GA and the leaf length. Another experiment, if the GA is involving, put more GA if leaf grows bigger. Or stop GA so that leaf grows is is smaller. We did that. We did the GA3 treatment as well as Paclo, which is a gibberellic acid phytohormone inhibitor. Leaf size reduced in response to GA inhibitor and increased in the uh, GA treatment, suggesting GA controls the rice leaf uh, uh, length. Now cell cycle, another thing. We started quantifying cell cycle. And cell cycle, basically there is a leaf kinematics. You can see how cells divide through the entire leaf. So here from the zero, it's the leaf base and towards the top, towards the top of the leaf that we are going. This is cultivated rice. You see that division is taking place only up to six or seven millimeters from the base. Whereas in the wild rice with the longer leaf, division is taking place up to the 15, 16 centimeter, 15, 16 millimeter from the leaf base. And that is again under the influence of GA because when we, this is a wild rice, when we applied GA here, so there is an increase in the division zone and when GA inhibitor, there is a decrease in division zone. So GA inhibited the division zone or cell division. Fine. Now what connects the GA and uh, you know, uh, cell cycle? We had transcription factors and GRF7, GRF8, where we, we, we uh, checked all the GRF transcription factor. What we found is specifically growth regulatory factor, GRF7 and 8, were expressed at high level in these wild rice, which is in the gray, compared to uh, the cultivated rice, an associated increase in the uh, cell cycle. And that was also similar with the treatment we found. So then confirming, this is all coming from the transcriptomics and some you know, pharmacological experiment. Confirming it, what we did, we knocked out or we down-regulated the GA biosynthesis, so GA level is going down, or GA signaling, which is GRF7 and GRF8 transcription factor. We saw decreased leaf length and decreased division zone size, which is leading to this model that GA through the involvement of GRF transcription factors, controls cell division to control leaf length in rice. And this is the framework that we are, uh, so this paper is again published in the new, new phytologist, and this is the framework that we are currently using for the leaf thickness and the mesophyll cell lobing. Maybe next time I will talk about the, those works, so those are already maturing now. So this is the framework uh, that we are using. Now, bigger and better question. When, when does the development to photosynthesis transition takes place? Because plant leaf will not start photosynthesizing right away. It has to grow, it has to develop, it has to differentiate. So we have some insight that transition takes place from the P3 to P4. So this is suit apical stem from where the leaf initiates. Primordia 1, primordia 2, leaf primordia 1, 2, P. So people have 
uh, shown that from leaf primordia 3 to leaf primordia 4, photosynthesis transition happens. What we did, we make the gene regulatory network, we, we for the wild and cultivated, we took all the stages, make the gene ex expression network uh, for all the, uh, I will not go into these details, and identified regulators, key regulatory transcription factors for all these developmental stages, and then we are comparing the cultivated rice and australensis for those regulators, and identified a few regulators that can make the transition from the development to photosynthesis earlier that we are functionally validating. Okay, so to conclude, what I showed you that from the very beginning that some of the wild rice excessions are photosynthetically efficient because of photochemical developmental traits which is likely mediated by the mesophyll traits and the leaf morphological traits. Then what I showed to you, GWAS using the cultivated rice that could be another way to identify loci that could lead to increased photosynthetic efficiency. Third, I showed you the leaf size regulation through the involvement of GA, cell cycle, and the transcription factor. Fourth, quick glimpse I have given the competitive transcriptomic to identify the regulators for the switch from the development to photosynthesis. So this is all I wanted to talk. Before I end, this is another direction that we are, I just one slide I wanted to show, where we saw that how temperature, high temperature, increasing temperature affects the leaf size. What we saw, that leaf size decreases under the uh, uh, high temperature with the involvement of some transcription factors. I will not go into the uh, detail. What we are intriguing now, that in rice, we have found GA cell cycle, GRF regulates leaf size. On the other hand, we have high temperature transcription factor that regulates the leaf size. How these to integrate to finally optimize the physiological outcome of photosynthesis that also we are trying to connect into in the lab. So these are the people who have done the most of the work I have presented uh, today. These three have already moved up from the lab. Mahesh is currently doing the GWAS and the major field cell loading study. Other people in the lab working on the various different interesting aspects. Thanks to Dr. A.K. Singh, Director IERI and Gopal Krishna's uh, IERI for, uh, collaborate, uh, for the collaboration with the GWAS studies. We do phenotyping in their IERI field. And then Dr. Kuldeep Singh for giving us the seeds of the wild rice when we started. Funding comes from all these sources. Thank you. And I would like to invite questions from the students now. I asked questions in the beginning, so it's now your turn to ask questions. Scientists can also ask, but the students. Hello, sir. Uh, my question is, you just showed the, the photosynthesis quantification. Mm -hmm. So how did you quantify photosynthesis? Is it a biochemical assay or any instrumental? It's an instrument which is called IRGA, infrared gas analyzer. Huh. That where we measure, so there is a chamber, yes. you put the leaf inside this thing, there is mm -hmm. some CO2 concentration. Mm -hmm. When the leaf is inside this chamber, CO2 will be used mm -hmm. for photosynthesis. Mm -hmm. In certain time, we quantify how much CO2 decrease has happened in that chamber. Okay. So that we take as a read out for quantum photosynthesis. Okay. In high photosynthetic lines, you will see more CO2 drop, and in less photosynthetic lines, you will see less CO2 drop. So we ex precisely quantify amount of CO2 used per unit leaf area per unit time in a leaf. Okay. okay. And my another question is, have you uh, ever quantified the photo quenching in this yes, process? Yes, we did. So for the all photochemical thing, that is another thing that we are also yes, trying. So part. NPQ, uh, non-photochemical no, quenching non we have uh, yes. uh, quantified. And uh, that, so it electron transport rays, if efficiency of photosystem 2 and non-photochemical quant quenching we have quantified this wild rice mm -hmm. which goes in the expected uh, expectation that result I have not shown and now we are also trying to find the regulators for the difference in this photochemical feature so we have quantified results seems in line okay thank you sir thank you very much hi Ashish yeah great talk I have one question because uh, you know we know that these wild relatives are there already, right? Like why these features have not been introduced into uh, cultivated varieties? So <coughs> there are, I mean, 
people have not really looked much into the photosynthetic variation between the cultivated wild rice. So far, there has been a lot of effort on the C3s. Now people have started. Here we are seeing in the rice, in the cultivated. People have seen other uh, like barley and tomato in different uh, countries. So this is just starting. So what? What there are in NRRI cutter, there are already some chromosomal segment substitution lines of the wild rice in the cultivated mm -hmm. uh, background. Okay. We'll be testing those lines. Nobody okay. has tested it. Okay. So we have observed, we'll be testing that. Okay. We'll see. Second question uh, Do you see this pathway, what you showed, uh, GA Della and uh, GRF1, mm -hmm. and is somewhat down regulated in the, say, for example, IR64? Say it again. Say it. Is it down regulated, this pathway? Yes, yes. To, to connect to the leaf area. Yes, 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 yes. So, so uh, IR64 that I have not shown, I have shown mm. here you the Nippon bear, and, but, mm. but we have all these so lines, so it's the same. So, okay. IR64 Nippon bear goes together, Australensis mm. to on and Latifolia goes together. Okay. And similarly, lesser amounts, so I think IR64 I have shown you the amount of hormone quantification yeah. here, so okay. the hormone quantification is less. Thank you. Mm. Actually, actually, all the high link variety are mainly semi dwarf. So automatically the GI biosynthesis is yes. hampered. Yes, it's, yes. It is not functional is there. Mm -hmm. So that's why that one of the reasons is that. But my just one to uh, just comments that uh, the what are the power? Now which power you have used for analyzing the photosynthesis? Photosynthetically active radiation. So which radiation? we quantify in the field condition where normally it's a range of 1,000 to 500. In the machine we fix at 1,500. That's what I'm saying. 1,500. Yeah, 1,500 power. That is steady state photosynthesis. A steady it's state. Not like that. No, that no any some no. fluctuating so or in light because a normal environment actually uh, accumulate a lot of fluctuating light and exactly. there are a lot of light variation. Exactly. But it is only that steady state. Currently it is in the steady, steady. Now we are doing the fluctuating light also. So how does light fluctuation affects the photochemical yeah, yeah, parameters? That, that's, that's another thing. And another, uh, just uh, they have shown that several haplotypes. Mm -hmm. Haplotypes which gene? <laughs> so that is interesting thing. We are, uh, where was that? So here, where was that? Here, yeah. So here, in this, we found uh, three transcription factors. One is GATA, one is MIP. Not as such directly photosynthetic genes. Some metabolism, sugar metabolism genes are there, and then three transcription factor. We are currently focusing on those transcription factor being regulator. So this is what our speculation. I don't know what will they give. No, but no, as you are mentioning haplotypes, haplotypes mm. certainly be from only one gene. Yes, it's not yes. from different genes. Yeah, no, that gene. No, so this. Because we are talking about the haploblock, and in that there is a GATA transcription factor that, that is showing the variation. Along with that, in that group also other genes are also uh, showing this uh, variation. But if you talk about the haplotype of one gene, GATA is showing the variation matching with this pattern. In and this. third, then another just last, mm. a lot of questions, but mm. just, uh, you know that photosynthesis is highly correlated with nitrogen content of yes, the plants. Yes, yes. And uh, most of the high link variety are nitrogen responsive. Yes. But still, you are showing that they are not so efficient in photosynthesis. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, uh, in terms of nitrogen, I mean, is there any nitrogen responsive genes which are regulating in, uh, I mean, uh, wild rice or not in compared to that high yielding cultivars? What is the status? We have not done because, the nitrogen. Because the leaf content and cellular content, cellular elongation, all are related to nitrogen content. Hundred percent agreed. Yes, hundred percent agreed. And nitrogen uptake so and regulation. Nitrogen uptake and regulation we have not checked. What we measured in these cultivated and wild rice that we I was just talking that in these we have measured the nitrogen content in the leaf, which was more in the in in the uh, wild rice, and using the same control condition. Uh, for whatever be the reason, I mean, we are, we are going in the pot and doing the experiment. So, these wild rice has higher nitrogen content. Now, where where the uh, switch lies in the uptake or utilization, that we do not know. That we may look for, but high nitrogen content for sure. And these, yeah. these, these wild rice just grow without nitrogen also. You just in the field, they yeah, just I know grow. That, <laughs> right. But only thing is that there is a long duration. Yes, yes. But yes. When is the rice variety exactly. 20 duration, uh -huh. then I don't know how, how, how this, I mean, uh, the hypothesis so, can fit. We, we, what we do at least in the field when we compare because the... Because their duration is more than five months. Yes, I agree. And we need to harvest in three and three and a half months. Agree, agree. So we are not harvesting. What we are doing, because when we grow in the field, we sow them almost at the same time, same treatment. And after three months, when the wild rice is getting matured, then uh, they are not maturing. They are still like vegetative state, but 
big biomass, right? So because here the photosimulate partitioning is optimized, here that is not optimized. So there is a big, so that takes another two months to give us the seeds, but biomass difference is very obvious. Uh, I have just uh, one question, not question, rather your thoughts about your next uh, looking into thickness mm -hmm. uh, and when we are looking into thickness then we have different layers of mesophilts yes. and it's mostly the upper layer which take the heat <laughs> because uh, I mean heat in terms of light because it's basically their NPQ which is messed up which leads to uh, downstream uh, uh, this thing process. So do you have any like uh, have any idea about how to deal with studying separately the efficiency on the top mesophyll cells and when it is thickness then that is gradient of light. So it's basically the upper layers which uh, mostly 20% of them contributed by the chloroplast movement yeah. and uh, therefore if they take the heat then it is going to reduce this uh, overall photosynthetic efficiency. So do you have any kind of technique or to study separately the upper mesophyll cells and say differentiate it from the lower mesophyll cell when you are considering the thickness instead of looking into overall effect. That Very interesting question. So in rice we have not because rice all the mesophyll looks, uh, cells look similar, right? So there is no dimorphism in the mesophyll cell in the rice. So in the rice we have not started doing anything like that. We are doing it in, in the Arabidopsis because Arabidopsis there is a dimorphism. There is a spongy mesophyll cell on the top which is round and the palisade mesophyll cell at the bottom which is elongated. So in the Arabidopsis we have started doing uh, some kind of uh, this study, very pre preliminary, that how is the physiological difference between the spongy and palisade. Rice we have not done. We'll see how does it comes in the mesophyll plant and I mean uh, model plant and then we'll go to the rice. We have a small observation that in case of rice, you know that that lower starter rice, they get a lot of mutual set. Yes. And that's why in those cases, leaves are layer thinner than the flag leaves and upper leaves. Mm -hmm. Because they make the mesophyll cell, mesophyll cell a little lesser to make the using, I mean, to improve the herb, for harvest efficiency. Exactly, exactly. Exactly, exactly. That's another thing. And also it's highly dependent on the light. So if you make leaf thicker and light intensity is less, there is no use. Right. So there is nothing saturating, then light leaf thickness will make a difference. Just, uh, yes. One comment and one query. The comment is this. Uh, ED has done a lot of work on the C3, C4 plus and Bill Cock, I mean Cook. On Indo is also involved in such work, and maybe this is where the answer to the question which Siddharth asked may be answered. A lot of these accessions that he has has got difference in their mesophyll and other things, and they, they try to do develop the crowns anatomy in this, not very successful after a lot of work, but still there's some something there. This is the comment. Mm -hmm. And probably you know about the temperature regulation in the chloroplast work mm -hmm. down in the Clavidomonas recently. Aral thermometer. Right. Mm -hmm. And I mentioned that in my uh, yes, yes. introduction. Maybe it's, a, it's time that people should go for the higher plant chloroplast therm or in a thermometer for the temperature. Yours seems to be a good system to yes. start. Yes. So first RNA thermometer thing, we were, we saw just paper, as you were also mentioning yes, yesterday, last month, month ago. last month this paper came, what we are trying to do, at least one of the project, trying to look for the anterograde signaling, which comes from the nucleus and regulates the chloroplastic chain. Mm -hmm. And there are some transcription factors that we have figured it out. Now, with, after this paper, we are trying to see if that, how does that go in the RNA thermometer, not exactly the al algal thing, climatomenus they talk about, but integrating the temperature thing, we started thinking, not really experiment, but we started thinking and very well taken suggestion, we'll certainly look into it. In the, in the climatomenus system, it is probably easier because yes. of the high, very big chloroplast. Mm -hmm. In the rice system, particularly, it may be a little difficult, mm. but still, even the dimorphism in the chloroplast, you can probably handle with the temperature sensitivity. Yes, yes. And you, since you are experts in GEOS, mm -hmm. uh, that will be helpful. Yeah, certainly, certainly very well taken suggestion and we are, we have started thinking into that direction. Okay. And to, uh, just to comment on your first comment uh, with the uh, um, bundle seed cells. So when we quantified all this cultivated and wild rice, we also quantified the different bundle seed area and size and mesophyll cell. What we saw, 
there is almost no correlation for the photosynthesis rate with bundle seed in the C3 plant, which is rice in our case, but there is a very good correlation in the uh, C4 plant because here bundle seed do not have chloroplast. They have, uh, I mean, uh, they are not photosynthetic. So here we do, here we see in the rice very limited association or correlation with the bundle uh, seed feature. So that's why we are not focusing that much, but we'll still see that uh, if anything overlaps with the C3, C4 project. Thank you. Thank you. Good work. Uh, thank you, sir. Question. Thank you. Uh, uh, yeah. I was wondering if there is a correlation between increase in photosynthesis and increase in the uh, energy value of the grain, rice grain. <laughs> like, how does it map? <laughs> energy value, and, I mean, I, energy value will not comment, but yield, that thing I can comment on, overall yield. Uh, that is another part that we did, that's another paper uh, in JXP couple of years. So what is interesting, while rice is high photosynthesis rate, but no yield. Cultivated rice, low photosynthesis, but high yield. So somehow, the photo, uh, photo assimilate partitioning is optimized in the cultivated rice, but not in the wild rice, because wild rice, wild plants are do not uh, meant to give us grains. We made them to give us grains by domestication, right? So they will just produce biomass and few seeds for them. So this was, but then we also figured out what was the reason for that, that the difference lied in the sucrose synthase enzyme that was leading to more structural carbohydrate, more cell wall uh, carbohydrates in the wild rice and not in the cultivated. Cultivated rice, everything was going to the grain. So this is how, so that's another aspect. Photosynthesis is another as one aspect, and down to that there is photo uh, partitioning that also needs to be optimized to see the increase in the grain yield or grain value that you are uh, seeing. Both come, needs to come together. We expect or we assume that cultivated rice has already been much optimized for the partitioning, so increasing photosynthesis might help getting more grain. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. So our next speaker is Sri Ramaya Gangappa, Dr. Sri Ramaya Gangappa. Again, an IPGR connection, really. <laughs> Actually, hey, hey, yes, did PhD. Is, did his B.Sc. and M.Sc. from University of Agricultural Science, Bangalore. Then he came to NIPGR for PhD. So another NIPGR connection. And after uh, PhD, he went to uh, uh, University of Gothenburg, Sweden for postdoctoral study um, since 2009 to 2012. After coming back, he joined as research scientist at NIT Durgapur. And uh, then again, went to another round of postdoc to John in Center. Um, and uh, after 2018, he, he came back and he went to John in Center with Mary Curie Fellowship, is it? Yeah. Okay. Then he came back and uh, received the um, prestigious Ramalinga Swami Reentry Fellowship. At the same time, he got position in ISCR Kolkata. Now he is uh, working as scientist in ISCR Kolkata. And his topic is? Yeah, yeah, sir. Hmm. ELF3, BBX2425, P4 module regulates thermosensory growth in Arabidopsis. Okay. Thank you, ma'am, for the nice introduction. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's really a great pleasure to be here. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, thank, thank you, uh, the, all the organizers like Professor uh, Chattopadhyay and Professor uh, uh, Mujumda and all the other organizers uh, who are really putting lots of effort to you know, bring together this conference. So as you can see, uh, I'm going to discuss about uh, work that what we are currently doing. Uh, it's one of the module, uh, which is L3, BBX2425, and P4 module, uh, controls thermosensory growth uh, in abdosis. Uh, I hope I'll try to explain uh, how, like, whether this module actually plays an important role in controlling thermosensory growth. So before going to uh, actual topic, uh, I'd like to uh, give a brief introduction about the, the topic. 
and we know that in general like uh, in nature plants are uh, like always constantly challenged with many factors both abiotic and uh, biotic and when you talk about uh, abiotic like uh, some of the ecological cues like light temperature day length they uh, play a very important role in regulating plant growth and development so we keep saying that you know plants are very important for the you know for the mankind but plants are here because of light right so light plays a key role in the regulation of plant growth and development and therefore all the downstream uh, aspects so in addition to light temperature also is a uh, like uh, a key role right Be because we all know that optimum temperature is important for the normal uh, physiology and metabolism therefore if there is an increase in temperature or reduction in temperature it affects plant growth and development like we face right when there is a high heat we feel very uh, hot uh, and at the same time if it is uh, very cold then we feel chilly so like that integration of these signals light and temperature are very key for the regulation of growth and uh, development and so my lab is interested in understanding how the temperature and light uh, specifically control plant growth at the same time how this uh, dictates interaction between uh, plant and pathogen so this is a part like small part of the work we have but mostly we are into a uh, development uh, aspect and yes yeah, so these are the specific objectives of our lab like understanding uh, the mechanisms of temperature mediated regulation of growth and development and also how does temperature coordinate growth and defense balance because always uh, there is a trade off between growth and uh, defense because when there is more growth and there is a uh, reduction in defense and vice versa and so by understanding this can we make the varieties which are more resilient for uh, you know, uh, like warmer climates or uh, changing climates using both Abdopsis and Rice as a model. Um, Going, coming to the temperature, how temperature affects plant growth and development, you know, just to give an example, say Abdopsis is a uh, like relatively a low temperature loving plant, like approximately 20 degree. Uh, and when you grow our Abdopsis at slightly warmer temperature, you can see there's a distinct morphological features that uh, you know, it grows with. Like you can see there's an elongated hypocotyl. This portion is called hypocotyl uh, for the students. And you can see the warm temperature is promoting hypocotyl elongation and also it's elongating its petiole. You see, otherwise the petioles are somewhat the very parallel to the soil or a ground. But at high temperature, you can see they start elongating so that they try to go away from the soil you know, uh, just to protect the meristem uh, which is uh, sealed uh, in between these leaves. And at the same time, they flower very early. There's supposed to be some data here because of, I think, uh, the version problem. So they also flower very early. So what uh, warm temperature is, yeah, I can see here, uh, but the data is not there. You can see these plants, they come to uh, flowering very early. You can see there's an uh, advance in the reproductive transition uh, at warm temperature compared to the optimum temperature. So this suggests that warm temperature accelerates plants growth and development. At the same time, okay, they're uh, promoting early flowering, but that's not, I mean, that's not actually not useful uh, for the plants, especially for the varieties when you talk about uh, with the increase in yield. Because it affects uh, seed germination, it also affects uh, the pot development, like the pots which are grown, plants which are grown at high temperature, they shatter their pots, because that's also not a uh, good quality for the farmers and also for the increase yield. At the same time, you know, the warm temperature grown plants uh, have a drastic reduction in the plant humidity. So if you see this here, you can see at 22 and uh, 27, uh, this particular mutant, it, it is a, a gain of function allele for one of the R gene, which is, which is a defense gene, and it triggers uh, a autoimmunity even in the absence of uh, the pathogen. But this can be uh, strongly suppressed if you just grow this particular mutant at high temperature. So this suggesting that warm temperature actually strongly suppresses defense responses as well. So you can see there's an increase in growth and there's a reduction in defense and you can see there's a uh, like coordination of this growth and defense is hampered. And just to like what we know about the warm temperature response, like what underlies this response? There's a lot of molecules have been identified so far and one of the key regulator uh, in all those uh, reports is the P4. P4 is, is, is coming out as a central regulator of warm temperature integration in plants. Why? 
because before it's required to promote hypocotyle, it's required to promote PTO, it's also required to promote flowering, uh, and so on. And at the same time, we have also shown that before coordinates growth and defense as well. So therefore, before is the central regulator of thermophagenic growth. And coming to the BBX, uh, just to give a few slides of introduction. So BBX proteins are nothing but a B box containing proteins. B box is a lic license rich uh, domain. And this domain is highly conserved across uh, uh, eukaryotes. That means that this domain probably played a crucial role uh, during the evolution. And it is still present and it's uh, playing an important role in the regulation of various uh, physiological and uh, processes. And you can see that the B-box proteins have been reported to play a uh, role in seedling development, flowering, and uh, photomorphogenesis, and so on. And however, uh, not much is known about uh, their role in temperature. And at the same time, and some of the B-box proteins like BBX24 and 25, these have been shown to be involved uh, as a negative regulators of photomorphogenesis uh, some time back. Uh, this is uh, our own, my own work. And so these BBX24 and 25, they belong to a group four uh, family. You can see there are five families which, which can be classified into, and you can, th these families can be seen across different uh, plants as well. And so these 24 and 25, they belong to group four, and they have B two B boxes, two N-terminal uh, B boxes. And how these B box, these BBX proteins, they regulate growth and development? Uh, it's mainly through protein-protein interaction, and some of the B boxes are, have also been shown to be acting as a transcription factors. <coughs> yeah, so our uh, aim was to see if BBX proteins have a role in uh, tem temperature uh, integration. So we started with uh, this BBX 24 and 25, and what we, um, so what we did, we took uh, single mutants and the double mutant, and we grew at two different temperature because 22 is the optimum temperature and the 27 is a warm temperature. It's called warm ambient temperature. Uh, why it is a warm ambient but not a heat stress? Because most of the HSPs are not activated at this particular temperature. Yeah, so when we see the phenotype, you can see the single mutants have a, a significant reduction in the hypocotyl in response to warm temperature compared to Columbia, but the double mutant is almost uh, com uh, insensitive. Uh, at uh, 27, means it's not able to elongate uh, at 27. So this suggests that BBX24 and 25 uh, are indeed essential for the warm temperature response. And also the BBX24 and 25, they're probably acting additively because both of them do have a phenotype, but when you uh, make a double mutant, the, the, the phenotype is much more enhanced. <coughs> and yeah, and this is true for both uh, short day condition and the long day condition. That means short day is nothing but a short day photo period. It's the length of the day and night. Uh, short day is a, you have a short day and longer night, and long day is a long day but a shorter night. And long day, it inhibits the thermophogenesis, as you can see in the difference in the hypocotyl, but short day promotes the thermophogenesis, as you can see, hypocotyl is much more longer. And this is all because of a concentration of P4 which accumulates uh, in the cell. And this is the hypocotyl uh, measurement data, and you can see in both the cases, these double mutants are much more insensitive compared to single mutants, and single mutants again consist in the showing significant uh, reduction in the uh, insensitive sensitivity to temperature in both short day and long day. And then <coughs> we also uh, like wanted to see even if overexpress uh, what happens uh, in, in, the, in these the transcription factors, like BBX24 and 25. Uh, so when you overexpress, you can see these, uh, the seedlings, they almost like behaving like a warm temperature grown uh, uh, seedlings of color, wild type. Okay? That means they are already showing a signs of a constitutive thermophogenesis when we overexpress these two factors. Uh, both under long day and short day. And when you measure the hypocotyl, again you can see there's a uh, nice difference between uh, the between Columbia and the overexpressor lines. So this suggests that so overexpression of BBX24 and 25 leads to constitutive thermosensory uh, growth with respect to hypocotyl uh, elongation. And then we wanted to see what uh, underlies this elongation, because we know 
cell elongation is important process if the plant has to, or a seedling has to elongate, right? So we then checked the cell, uh, the morphologies and we found that the cell at length was elongated when you overexpress these uh, factors. But in the double mutant, you can see the cell uh, length is, uh, is reduced. And especially at high temperature, you can see there's a drastic reduction in the cell elongation. But when you overexpress, you can see now the cells are becoming much more longer. Okay? Even in uh, 22 also, you can, they're significantly longer than uh, the wild type. So this suggests that the uh, BBX24 and 25 mediated uh, elongation of hypocotyl, uh, which is mediated by temperature, is actually due to the increase in cell elongation. <coughs> then we wanted to see this increase in cell elongation is actually associated with some of the genes which are involved in this process, right? Because for any physiological process, there is a molecular mechanism involved. For the elongation of uh, cells, we need to have the enzymes which are kind of loosens these cell walls so that cells can elongate. And many of the downstream targets, like one of the downstream target, which is directly involved in cell, al cell wall elongation is XTR7. This is one of the enzyme. And now you can see the double mutant, their exp its expression is uh, less, uh, but in the overexpressed rate is more. At the same time, we know that auxin plays an important role in uh, cell elongation. And so therefore, we wanted to see some of the auxin markers, like EK8 is nothing but EK8. So this is the auxin biosynthetic gene, okay? And if you see the expression of EK8, you can see it's uh, reduced compared to uh, Columbia in the double mutant, but in the over expressor lines, it is increased. Suggesting that most likely the auxin uh, biosynthesis, increased auxin biosynthesis might be driving this cell elongation. <coughs> At the same time, we also uh, checked some of the uh, signaling uh, markers, marker genes like PRE5 and IA19. These are the general auxin signaling markers and you can also see the similar effect. In the double mutant, it is, they are downregulated. In the overexpressor, they are uh, upregulated. <coughs> so therefore, the combination of uh, now, these genes is probably uh, driving the hypocotyl uh, elongation in response to warm temperature. Then we wanted to see, yeah, okay, oh, okay, I'll just try to finish. Yeah, so then we, uh, we wanted to see why this is happening, okay, and because we know that in the previous slide, if you see all these targets which are actually regulated by P4, which is a key transcription factor as I was talking in the beginning, and when we see the PIP, P4 uh, protein stability, the P4 protein stability is going down drastically in the double mutant and, in, and in specifically at high temperature uh, compared to Columbia. So this most likely that the redu reduction in this gene expression is due to the P4, uh, reduced accumulation of uh, P4 stability. Okay. And same similar experiments what, it, what we like did like from 20 to 27, like short term warmth and, and also when we checked in the over expression line. So whenever there is a more BBX24 and 25, you see more P4. And we also see that the both these pro, uh, proteins, uh, the genes, they get induced in response to warm temperature, as you can see, at uh, like ZT23 and ZT3. ZT23 and ZT3 are nothing but this uh, time of the day. ZT23 is, is uh, typically end of the night, and ZT3 is uh, during the day, the like the beginning of the day. And we see both these genes, they get upregulated, uh, more in the warm temperature, okay? And they, they're also light induced, but at high temperature, you can see they're upregulated. And at the same time, the protein also, uh, they show similar trend in terms of protein accumulation. So this suggests that BBX24 and 25 expression and the protein accumulation uh, is uh, elevated in response to warm temperature. And that uh, increase in these BBX24 and 25, it's they're trying to uh, increase the P4 concentration. How they're trying to increase the P4 concentration? Most likely through physical uh, interaction that I'll come in a while. And also to, in order to prove whether the BBX24 and 25 are really required for the P4 uh, function. So what we did, we took P4 overexpressor line. You can see this P4 overexpression line as a constitutive thermosensory response because the hypocotyl is already very tall. And now when we uh, knocked out both BBX24 and 25 in this overexpressor line, you can see it's strongly suppressed, okay? So this suggests that the BBX24 and 25 activity is actually required to maintain P4 function, uh, what we see here. 
And this is also inconsistent uh, with the gene expression. I'm not going to detail. Uh, at the same time, the protein. You can see the protein accumulation uh, is almost completely gone in the double mutant, but in the single, single mutants, uh, it's visibly reduced. Okay. So this is a very strong data, uh, what we got. Like, suggests that you know, 24 and 25 are actually essential to maintain PIFO concentration uh, in the cell in order to promote elongation and also the thermosensory growth. Yeah, this again uh, showed uh, in a different so please, way. Please conclude. Uh, is it yeah, just yeah. Or delayed? Yeah. I have mo how many minutes I have? Finish? Okay. I'll just finish. <laughs> yeah, so this is the same. And yeah, this uh, interaction I told you, most likely how it is stabilizing is through physical interaction. And we showed different ways that, you know, both BBX24 and 25 physically interact. Uh, and so on. Then we also, um, like, found a connection with the LF3, that's uh, exactly what LF3, uh, which is there in the title, because LF3 is a clock uh, protein, uh, which controls PIF4 uh, activity. So here what we are saying is that uh, LF3 inhibits BBX24 and 25 during under low temperature, but und under high temperature, because LF3 is getting inhibited by warm temperature, uh, therefore the BBX24 and 25 uh, activity goes up, and that leads to enhanced uh, uh, PIF4 uh, function. Yes, this is all this genetics, uh, what we did, uh, it's a gene expression, and same, you can also see the early flowering of uh, P4 and L3 uh, dependent on the BX24 and 25. Yes, this is a summary, just to uh, summarize, you can see warm temperature promotes BBX24 and 25 transcription and protein activity, which leads to stabilization of P4 and leading to the thermophagenesis. At the same time, L3 mediated uh, the inhibition of P4 so this is during uh, the optimum temperature and the warm temperature because warm temperature inhibits L3. This, uh, this inhibition is further downregulated. Therefore, this further potentiates the uh, P4 uh, signaling output, so leading to a stronger uh, photomorphogenesis. Yeah, so that's it about the work and this, all, uh, this acknowledgement. So mainly the, this work was carried out by the Bidal and uh, other, uh, the Shivani and Gaurango. And thanks to all the collaborators and the uh, uh, funding. And also I would, sh I would like to say thanks to Alok sir, because he gave some of the initial reagents that we wanted, and Manoj and Ashish, uh, thank you. Yeah, if you have any questions, can you? Thank you, thank you, Dr. Gangapa. Now it is open for any comments or any queries. Did you saw what happens to BVX this 24-25 in P4 mutant? Or what happens to P4 in this BVF? Uh? Yeah, P4 we do see the adaptation uh, in the classification. Not so, so, so strong. Not uh, we see like what we see in the protein level. It is pretty subtle downregulation in the double mutant. I try to regulate So the any level. idea whether this one is regulating the other one or vice versa? BBX to P4 or P4 to BBX? Uh, Very good thing. I, I think I missed it. Uh, the phenotype of P4 overexpression in BBX double mutant. How does th those look like? Yeah, you can see it's strongly uh, compromised. Yeah, so this is the one. Uh -huh, right. <coughs> yeah, okay, compromised. Fine. And uh, did you also try overexpressing BBX in P4 mutant? Oh, that we have. We have the data. So, what is was that? that suppressing? <laughs> That's yes, complex, right? Yeah. It's controlling mainly flowering and contracting yes, yes. temperature. So, uh, regarding the uh, 
VBX 24 and 24, whether they are also, I mean, higher expression in dusk and, and lower expression in morning? Oh, yeah, that's what exactly I showed here. Uh, no, the, uh, to go back. Yeah, you can see the expression is uh, more in the day. In the dark, expression is less. But in ELF3, it's reverse. Yeah, in ELF3, it is more. That's what we are showing in the later part. And this uh, expression is actually due to lack of ELF3 because what we know is that ELF3 is also a thermosensor which negatively affects uh, no, temperature sensing. ELF3 yeah. actually also interact with PIF4? Yeah, it interacts. Yes, okay. yes, yes. Finally, yes. it sends the thermo, exactly. thermo and then follow that uh, polarizing yes. genes and other regulation. Yeah, yeah. So if it is B, then it should also, I mean, it should not be also the uh, same way that it should higher expression in dusk and lower expression in evening? Yeah, well, that's data I did not discuss because of time. You can see that. No, I think I, yeah, so what we see specifically BBX 24 and 25 expression drops down in the evening, but at high temperature, they still maintain significantly higher than the uh, wild type. Yeah, so therefore, that's, that's how we are connecting uh, what is the role of ELF3 in the regulation of uh, and this. And whether over express lines flowers early or not? Uh, BBX24 flowers early, 24 didn't show much difference. Yeah. Now, if, if hypervotolite loads, it's becoming, I mean, yes, the flowers longer, early. then it's flowers, yeah, flowers early. Flowers early. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you for a nice Thank you. work and talk. Next speaker is Dr. Monoj Maji. He is also from NIPGR, and uh, he has also a lot of awards and honors. He is also fellow in Indian Academy of Science, National Academy of Science, and uh, that Max Planck Institute. He, has, he visited, I mean, uh, Department of Plant Breeding and Genetics for some other in some bilateral exchange program, and he has a lot of good work and good publication throughout the, his career. Now I request Dr. Maji to take the dais. Yeah, I can. Okay. Thank you, Somnath and Sampati, for the introductions. And I also thank the organizers, particularly my staff supervisor, Professor Rundari Majumdar, for giving me this opportunity. It's kind of a reunion for me. So I could meet one of my friend Omid 20 years, after 20 years. Okay, so I'm going to talk about one of our recent work on jazz. So I put a little catchy title, Skip Jazz by Skip 31, a tale of seed maturation and resistance and tolerance. Hopefully I can justify at the end of my talk. So our lab is primarily work on seeds. We have been trying to understand some of the spectacular features of seed. One of them you can see that seed can stay alive for a very prolonged period of time. So they have a unique ability to retain their germination ability as well as viability for a very prolonged period of time. So here I am showing two unbelievable examples of seed longevity. Here you can see the dead palm, which is khejur basically. They can survive as many as 2,000 years, while there is another seed called sacred lotus or paddo, which can be survive as many as 1,300 years. So these type of seeds are called orthodox seeds because you can store those seeds and still those seeds are viable. So basically they are desiccation tolerant, that's why they can retain their viability for a very prolonged period in a desiccated state. So fortunately, all of the crop plants that they produce are orthodox seeds so that we can store them, we can use according to our need. While there is another classes of seed called recalcitrant seed. So basically they are desiccation intolerant or desiccation sensitive. So you cannot store them. So they cannot retain viability for a very prolonged period of time. Here are some examples, oak, mango, lychee, aquatic species. Some of them can survive only for a week. So in our lab, we are trying to understand a very fundamental question, how does orthodox seeds stay alive for a very prolonged period of time? And can we do something? Can we increase the seed vigor and storage life by manipulating the genes or processes? So how does seed survive for a so long period? So they have adopted a very smart strategy called drying without dying. So they, they basically lose their water content during the developmental phases, particularly during the seed maturation phase. Here you can see. So when they mature, they almost become a dry, only 10 to 12% moisture content is there. So this drying actually allows us to reduce their metabolic activity 
and resistant to pathogens. So when they reduce their metabolic activity, they can save their energy, save their resources for a long period of time, which also allows us to reduce the toxic by byproduct like ROS. So we, these are the prerequisites for seed violet and seed longevity. But without difficult to live, all we know. So this drying basically creates a very stressful environment into the seed, like lot of cellular damage, DNA damage, protein damage, there are a lot of undesired modifications. So how seed can overcome this damage? So they have a very remarkable adaptability. They have acquired this property called desiccation tolerance. So this desiccation tolerance allows seed to dry but not to die. So this desiccation tolerance includes like protection mechanisms, repair mechanisms. So protection includes the accumulation of sugars, RFOs, LIA protein, HSPs, HSF, so they are basically very important to uh, take care of the protein damage. While there are certain classes of repair enzymes, so seed has a very strong protein repairing systems, which includes a lot of protein repairing enzymes like PIMT and MSR. So they repair this undesired modification, which is detrimental for seed viability and seed longevity. So this seed maturation is a very complex, complex physiological phenomenon, which is mainly regulated by AB hormone, so there are a lot of ABI transcription factors, they are called master regulators, they regulate the seed maturation stage. So seed maturation stage is very important because this allows seed to dry or to desiccate and can leave them for a longer period of time. So in our lab we are trying to understand the mechanism underlying seed desiccation tolerance, seed, uh, seed vigor, viability, we, have, we are working on three different aspects. So we have a very uh, repair system. We, we, we extensively work on this protein repair system, but today I will talk about one of the box protein that we have recently identified, which plays a very important role, which regulates ABA signaling and how this ABA signaling promotes seed maturation. Today I am going to talk about this. So we all know that ABA signaling plays a very critical role in seed maturation, like onset of seed dormancy, the ABA hormone accumulation is very high, the activation of ABA signaling. However, during germination, we all know that there is a repression of ABA signaling. So the amount of AB hormone is goes down in order to germination. So how seed actually achieve this differential AB signaling during phase transitions? So from seed maturation where AB signaling is very high, while in seed, seed germination the AB signaling is repressed. So how seed actually make this happen? So this is a very uh, generalized pathway AB signaling, so which is a very complicated signaling pathway where you can see this ABI transcription factors which includes ABI4, ABI3, ABI5. They are the master regulators of the AB signaling, also the seed maturation. So this ABA transcription factors is activating AB responsive genes and they activate the AB signaling. So this is already a complex pathway. We have added an extra layer of regulation and make it much more complicated. So this Vishal actually proposed a model that is called Skip 31 ZAZ and ABITS model, which is required to this uh, differential maintaining this AB signaling differentiation during phase transitions. So I'll just briefly introduce what is Skip 31. So Skip 31 is basically an F-box protein, which is a part of SCAP3 ligase complex. Here you can see, so this is a four component complex. So this F-box protein, that is basically Skip 31 protein. And it's a part of the ubiquitin 26S proteasome pathway, which basically eliminates protein very specific way from the cell. So the job of the F-box protein is to recognize this target protein, which is to be degraded through this proteasome pathway. So, in order to verify this skip 31 is really a bona fide F box protein, we have uh, carried out few experiments. So this F box skip 31 protein has an N-terminal F box domain. That's why it's called as a F box protein. And there is a C-terminal variable domain. So first we have checked whether this F box protein interact with this SKP like protein. So we have checked the interaction of among this all ASK protein. ASK means Arabidopsis SKP like protein. That's why it's name as a ASK protein. So we found that skip 31 interacts most of the SK proteins and it's also a nuclear localized F-box protein. So from this data, we can conclude the skip 31 is a nuclear localized F-box protein. So what it does, to understand the function of the skip 31, first we had looked at the expression pattern, where it expressed and when it expressed. So here you can see the, the skip 31 is highly expressed in the seed. So we have actually checked the transcript accumulation of skip 31 in different organs of the plant. And this yeah, here you can see that seed preferentially expresses this skip 31. So to validate this expression, we have also analyzed that promoter grass fusion analysis. Here you can see that skip 31 promoter driven grass expression is highly prominent in the embryo. 
So through this data we can make sure that this skip 31 is highly expressed in the seed. To understand better, we have actually analyzed the skip 31 expression in different developmental stage and here you can see that skip 31 is primarily upregulated during the seed maturation stage whereas and after during germination the expression goes down which indicates that skip 31 plays a possible role only during the maturation stage and it's also induced by the AB hormone and dehydration which is expected. So in a, in a dry seed there is a lot of AB hormones and as well it creates a dehydration stress. So to understand the function of the skip 31 protein we have analyzed the mutant's phenotype. Here you can see, so this mutant has a three distinct defect. So one of them is here you can see these are the mutant lines where the seed germination is highly reduced. So this is one defect that the mutant shows a severe reduction of seed germination Another defect is there is a reduction in viability and another third defect is you can see the shrunken seeds. So the morphology of the seed is also defective. So it is not looking like a wild type a round shaped seed. So it is a shrunken seed distorted phenotype. So from this mutant we have actually got an idea that this skip 31 plays a very possible role in seed during seed germination, during seed viability and also the morphology. So to confirm this role we have generated RNAi lines seed specific overexpression lines as well as complementation lines. And we found exactly similar phenotype what we have observed in the knockout mutant or knockdown mutant. The RNA lines show defects in also reduction of seed germination, reduction in viability as well as there is a defect in the seed morphology. Here you can see. While the seed specific overexpression actually improves the seed vigor and viability. So this actually allows us to confirm that skip 31 probably plays a very important role for seed germination for maintaining seed vigor and viability. So to further confirm we actually check whether can overexpression of skip 31 protein in a mutant background rescue this defect. That is what we exactly observed that this mutant phenotype, this mutant phenotype is rescued by this overexpression of skip 31 in this mutant background. So the mutant plants were expressing skip 31, so a full rescue of the defects seen in the mutant for seed maturation, viability and germination ability. So from all these experiments, genetic experiments, we actually confirm that skip 31 plays a very important role for maintaining seed vigor, germination and viability. So now there are two possibilities. Since we have observed this defect in, in, seed ma in a mature seeds or should I call a one week old seeds, so what is the defect actually? Is it the defect seen that during embryo development, whether the embryo is not fully formed or, did it, or its defect upon germination? So to dissect this, we have actually analyzed this germination, desiccation tolerance phenotype analysis during different stages of seed development as well as, as well as upon storage. So here you can see that there is no defect at all in the early seed developmental stage. So the embryo is fully formed, they can able to germinate if you check the germination after age 5 stage when the embryo is fully formed there is no defect. So there is 100 percent germination so there is a almost similar germination pattern of wild type mutant overexpression line and RNAi lines. While we started observing defects from the age 6 stage or during the seed maturation stage. So that means there is something skip 31 does during the seed maturation stage so that this in absence of skip 31 in this stage it leads to a reduction in seed viability, reduction in seed maturation which also reflected during the storage. So if the, there is a no proper seed maturation then you will see a hypersensitivity to the aging. The seeds are very sensitive to the storage. That is what we observe. So now the question is how skip 31 is, there is some noise. So how skip 31 participates in seed maturation? So why skip 31 mutants lines are compromised in seed maturation? So to, to understand the function of the skip 31 since I told you that skip 31 is basically an A-box protein. So unless we identify the target protein which is degraded by this 26S proteasome pathway, we cannot actually explain the mechanism of action. So we, we tried to identify the target protein. So we have done is to have is to have a hidden library scanning and to our surprise we found a interactive protein which is appears to be a ZAS protein. So what is ZAS protein? So ZAS protein is a very famous protein, popular protein in J signaling pathway. So JAD acts as a repressor protein of J signaling which represses MIG2 activity. So here this JAD basically acts as a repressor protein which represses the J responsive genes by 
forming a complex with the MIG2, which is a positive regulator or activator of the J-responsive genes, and this replaces the expression of J-responsive genes via topless ninja in absence of J-isolation. So basically, JH protein is a repressor of JH signaling pathway. But it's, it has already been known that JH protein is targeted by the KOI-1 Fbox protein in presence of J-isolation. So this KOI-1 and Fbox protein targets this JH protein, which is eventually degraded through the 26S proteasome pathway. So that also make us more surprised because JAJ is already targeted by another Fbox protein, which has previously been identified. So what is the need of this, our skip 31 protein, which is required to target this JAJ again and degrade through this 26S proteasome pathway. But in this interaction, here you can see it requires a jasmonic acid isolation. So to interact the KOI-1 to JAJ, it requires a jasmonic acid isolation. Whether our interaction, we don't know that whether it also requires jasmonic isolation or it's independent to jasmonic acid isolation. So to answer this question, first we have checked the, their interaction in presence and absence of cor coronatin or jasmonic acid isolations. So here you can see that it doesn't require actually the coronatin or jasmonic acid isolation for their interaction. It doesn't matter whether you apply uh, these uh, chemicals into the media or not. So in, in, invariably we found the interaction of ZAZ, our skip 31 with ZAZ 6, ZAZ 10 and ZAZ 11. While in the KOI-1, which is the another post protein which has previously been identified, which requires a jasmonic acid isolation. So in presence of only jasmonic acid isolation or coronatin, it can all interact, but not without this coronatin. So that, so that something differences in their interaction patterns. So we have confirmed this interaction by three different other... Only three minutes? Okay, so I'll move forward. So we have confirmed this interaction with uh, biopsy and QIP. So now, to understand what is the domain that's uh, specifically recognized with this uh, JAJ protein and SKIP31 interactions. So eventually we found, so there are a lot of deletion construct and we have checked their interactions. We found that JAJ domain is important for the SKIP31 interaction of the JAJ protein. So now, as we know that, okay, there is some interaction between SKIP31 and JAJ protein, but what is the fate of this interaction? whether it mediates the ubiquitin process and degradation, that's what we have confirmed here. So we made an in vitro ubiquitin experiment to make sure that actually skip 31 mediates the ubiquitin of the ZAS protein and that eventually leads to the degradation of this ZAS protein. So we have made a several experiments with KOI-1 mutant extracts, wild type background and RNA background and found that the ZAS protein is not stable in presence of uh, our ATS capacitor protein in over expression lines, but in RNA lines, they are stable. So basically, in this experiment, we can confirm that skip 31 mediates ubiquitination of the ZAS protein that subsequently led, led them to degradation via 26S proteasome pathway. So, so far, we can conclude that skip 31 positively regulates the seed maturation, desiccation tolerance, and seed vigor, and it also interacts with the ZAS degradation. However, whether these two phenomena is independent or is there any connection, or is, in another words, can we say that this skip 31 positively regulates seed maturation, desiccation tolerance, seed vigor by mediating jazz degradation. To confirm this, we have made a several overexpression lines and mutant lines for this jazz 6, jazz 11 and jazz 6, 11 overexpression lines. And we found that there is some defects in the jazz 6 overexpression lines. So we can conclude that this skip 31 positively regulates seed maturation, desiccation tolerance, seed vigor by mediating jazz degradation. So here you can see that JAS-6 overexpression lines mimic the phenotype of SKIP-31 RNA lines. So that, that defect we observed in RNA lines and SKIP-31 mutant lines, we found exactly similar phenotype when we overexpressed the JAS-6 JAS six or JAS-11 overexpression. Okay, so that makes that we can establish that this phenotype is only due to the targeting of the JAS protein. So now the next question is how does JAS negatively regulate the seed maturation? or seed vigor and viability. So we looked at the literature and we found that ZAZ actually interact with the ABI-13 and ABI-15 transcription factor which is required for ABA signaling. So this ZAZ actually replaced the ABA signaling pathway. That's why we observed this kind of phenotype. So in our case, we also checked the interaction of ZAZ protein and ABI transcription factor and we found that this, our skip 31, a ZAZ protein also interacts with the ABI-14 and ABI-15. So the next question is, are ABA responsive genes downregulated in skip 31 RNA lines and ZAZ overexpression lines? Because unless there is no down regulation of this one, then we should not see that uh, defect in the seed viability and maturity. 
So we have actually checked the heavy responsive genes that are down regulated in skip 31 RNA lines and JAD6 over expression lines. So this is the mechanism. So JAD actually interact with the heavy transcription factor, which leads to the re repress of heavy responsive genes that repress the heavy signaling. So that's why you've seen the defect in seed maturation in skip 31 RNA and JAD6 over expression lines. So we have analyzed a lot of heavy responsive genes in all these different genotypes, and we found that these genes are really repressed in case of skip 31 RNA lines and over expression lines. That's why I see defect in the seed maturation and seed viability. We, also, we have also analyzed whether the, is this module affects the seed reserve accumulation or not. So we found that the, there is reduction in starch accumulation and SSP, that is seed storage protein accumulation. So all these are affected when there is no skip 31 in, in, this, in, this, in this plan. So how skip 31 expression is regulated during seed maturation, we have also analyzed or we have also investigated. So I'm not going to the detail because of the time. So we found that ABI5 cis regulatory res response element is also present in the promoter of SKIP31. So this ABI5 actually upregulates or activates this gene expression. But as we know that ABI5 also interacts with the ZAS protein which actually reduces the expression. So there is some food, uh, feedback mechanism exists in this expression regulation of the SKIP31. So now I come to the conclusion and the working model. So I told you that ZAS actually repressed the ABI5 activity that replaced the ABS signaling in absence of skip 31. So during seed germination, since the ABS signaling should be repressed, so that time there is no skip 31 in a seed. So that's why that JAD6 actually or JAD11 actually replaced the ABI5 activity. So there is a down regulation of the uh, seed uh, AB responsive genes which affect the seed maturation and seed bigger. While when there is a seed maturation, there is a high expression of skip 31 which de repress the ABI5 activity by targeting ZAS and promote ABI signaling pathway. So this skip 31 target ZAS and let them to degrade by 26S potassium pathway, which allow ABI5 to free and bind with the promoter region and activate the downstream genes, which is important for the seed maturation and seed bigger. So this is how skip 31 regulates the ABI5 activity on ABI signaling pathway by interacting ZAS and by degrading the ZAS protein. So most of the work actually done by the Vishal that I've already mentioned, and these are my group actually. So as I'm working on a PIMT, that is the protein repairing system, so this group actually works on the PIMT, and this is uh, RFO, and this MSR, so I'm working also in the MSR protein repairing engine. So, so these are my lab members, so I acknowledge them. Thank you. So is there any questions? Thank you, Dr. Manoj, for your lucid lecture. Now it is open for any comments or remarks. No Manoj, uh, just a small query, maybe a little off the track. So we have seen that uh, this uh, skip 31 is also getting moderately level expressed in leaves as well. Yeah. So any idea what they're doing in the leaves? That we have not yet checked because uh, it may target ZAS protein also in the leaf that may because uh, it, it, it targets the ZAS protein which is very important for jasmonic acid signaling pathway. So in leaf also that uh, maybe it can modulate the jasmonic acid signaling in the leaf also but we have not seen any defect in the seed as such although we have uh, just uh, did not look at in a very critical way but so far there is no defect in the leaf. Only defect we have seen in the seeds and it's highly expressed in the seed. Okay. So, it is not question, just a comment. I, I know Monoj since 1998 or so. Yeah, so I have joined the PMCG in 1998. About 25 years or so when he came to our department as a junior research scholar. Um, and he did PhD under Professor Lahir yeah, yeah. in our department. So, he, their study was so uh, important at those days and it is very i feel delighted to see monoj is growing so much and now he is becoming such an important and uh, matured scientist <laughs> it's very uh, nice to see him growing in this way and uh, some parts of his uh, phd study has been uh, yeah, granted I as us patent and indian patent tobacco so transformation and yeah. raising transgenic and lines i actually did in company. yeah so credit goes to both mono and, <laughs> and you too also. <laughs> thank you so much 
Okay, thank you. Another, another scientist from Professor Lahiri Madhunda's lab, Dr. Shudip Tore. <laughs> And he is uh, now working as uh, faculty members in Calcutta University Botany Department. And he did PhD. He is also student of Calcutta University Botany Department, uh, BSc, AMSc. And then did PhD under Professor Lahiri Mojumdar. Uh, after PhD, he uh, used Bo DST Boy Scouts Fellowship uh, during 2010 to 11. Yeah. And then he came back and uh, joined Calcutta University. He is also doing a very interesting science and uh, dehydrin. Dehydrin, a key chessman in stress biology. Wow, very interesting title, very catchy and interesting. Thank you. Within 20 minutes, okay. Okay. So, very good afternoon to all of you. It's uh, really uh, uh, thank you, Shampadi, for giving a wonderful uh, introduction to my career. So, thanks for the kind words. And uh, actually, uh, when I started, uh, I started with the dehydrins, and uh, now I will be going to go give a snapshot of just what we are doing in our lab and not hold you too long because I guess uh, already I was warned that I have only 20 minutes for now on. So just starting up. Uh, I sincerely thank the organizers and uh, Professor Lairi Mojinder for inviting me to this uh, platform. And I will start with this particular topic, uh, dehydrins a key chess man in stress biology. So, go, this dehydrins, we think, is really an interesting uh, protein in the plant system. In the pl when plants are when plants are under abiotic stress condition, it goes through. So it it is having. So it is having a. Uh, primary stress as well as secondary stress and uh, there is a membrane damage and uh, DNA damage as well. So these dehydrins actually protect somewhere over here. So this protection is giving plants some kind of uh, protection to the whole system as well. And dehydrins as well as the sugars and the free uh, antioxidants like the anthocyanins are actually our go interest where we are working on. So this maintains the homeostasis and gives the protection against stress. So when we started, we thought that dehydrins might be a key protein which might give the protection as these are uh, present in the seeds as well as similar to dehydrins, we also have the sugars, the raffinose family oligosaccharides, which are actually giving seeds, the seeds or the embryos, which are highly desiccated to desiccation tolerant. So in that case, there is a lot of um, low water potential. In that case, uh, these anthocyanins, raffinose family oligosaccharides, and the dehydrins, these three we termed might be helping the win the battle against uh, dehydration stress. So we hypothesize that, and we, that is the lesson taken from the seeds, where we see that there is a lot of late embryogenesis abundant protein and uh, secondary metabolites like anthocyanins coming up, and as well as a lot of sugars are uh, produced in this. Lot of sugars are actually produced
So these ear proteins are actually uh, having the dihydrins, which is a group of uh, Lia proteins, and they, sorry, so, uh, and there is the there is a particular kind of segments which uh, we t uh, there it was termed Y segment, S segment, and the K segments, and they have the some amount of conservedness in these proteins. So these enzymes and membrane protection are given by the dihydrins, as well as they give defense against the abiotic stresses. Now these dehydrins are intrinsically disordered and that is the beauty of the system that this disordered protein is actually uh, giving the protection to a whole lot of proteins which are actually structured and these structured proteins can actually uh, be in the system and not go out of the system to continue with the uh, metabolic processes as well as uh, cells, uh, cell cycles and everything going on together. So these dehydrins having the intrinsically disordered proteins are, there is a variation in the number of the segments. What you can see over here, there are different, there are different classes of dehydrins which are based on the segments and the arrangements of the segments. So this makes dehydrins unique, and there is not a conserved sequence for these proteins. These are not actually conserved. This, there is a lot of variation, variation in the size as well as variation in the number of dehydrins that are occurred. So in different plant systems, there is a difference in the number and the amino acid length of the proteins that are present. That is what makes dehydrin unique and different. But our question was how, how plants survive in this drought stress condition? And this, for this, we had the best bet with us, the sorghum model, as it, when I joined, it was already sequenced, and we thought that this is a drought tolerant model, which uh, is adapted to warm climatic conditions. So we thought of taking this up. And now this millet year, we are having the sorghums and the millets coming up in this uh, century, in this decade. So uh, we are going with the sorghum. We found that how many dehydrins are there. So we wanted to find out in the whole sequence, sequence genome, how many dehydrin uh, uh, sequences are present. So we found that there are three dehydrins uh, out of which DHN1 and DHN2, these two are actually upregulated in the heat stress condition, heat stress as well as dehydration stress condition. So we found that these dehydrins might be giving, as expected, might be giving some protection to the plant system which is growing in the such a dwarf, uh, drought condition prone areas, drought prone areas. So we uh, bacterially express the dehydrin molecules and uh, we got the, uh, we compared with um, the, we compared the protein which uh, was expressed in the bacterial system that to see how it protects a thermos uh, labile enzyme like LDH to, um, uh, to how it protects the thermo labile enzyme. So we thought that this, uh, and it showed a good amount of protection compared to uh, here we have used glycerol as well as BSA to find out the level of protection and it was higher compared to those. So we incorporated the, that in the dehydrin sequence into the plant system in a model plant system tobacco and see that in the transgenic plants we see that uh, even after 15 days of heat stress uh, the plants were able to grow and 15 days of heat as well as uh, dehydration stress the plants were able to grow were fine and they were health, happy recovering after seven days of uh, seven days of recovery system. So then we moved on to find out that the dehydrins were able also to protect the oxidative damage uh, against transgenic uh, in the transgenic plants by uh, scavenging the ROS. We are not getting, going into the details of this uh, um, thing. So we will proceed quickly to find out that dehydrins impart protection, that is known, but how? So with that, 
in mind, we thought that there might be an amino acid composition or the segments which might be responsible. So, for that we, oh, sorry, so, so we uh, generated deletion mutants like here we have the YSK K2 type dihydrin, which is the full length dihydrin protein and we generated deletion mutants and found out that to our sub surprise that when the K segment was deleted, we got the least activity for the protection, least protection activity. So in absence of K segment, we are unable to protect or unable to show the exact protection. Or that there might be something in the K segment. So we looked at the structure and this structure was a, uh, it showed a amphipathic alpha helix. The K segment showed an amphipathic alpha helix and we mutated those K segment by uh, incorporating proline residues as well as which is a helix breaker as well as uh, we shuffled the sequence together just to, um, but keeping the sequence same but just shuffle to just eliminate the amphipathic alpha helix that is forming. So once we did that, we see, uh, again, it's a surprising uh, result that we see that there is a drastic change in the protection amount. Now, we understand that these uh, dehydrins are able to protect and the K segment is responsible. So the K segment and the structure is responsible for function of dihydrin. So we thought that, and we wondered, what if we have a similar structure but different amino acid composition? That means a similar structure like the K segment, which gives a amphibathic alpha helicity but a different amino acid sequence. So we scanned the whole genome database and we found out, to our surprise, that it was serendipitously discovered a unique sequence in PPDHNA. This is also a dehydrin sequence, and, but having the similar propensity for formation of alpha helix in the molecule. These segments are not the K segments, but something different. But it forms the alpha helix uh, seg, sequ, uh, alpha helical regions in the whole protein. So, this PPDHN sequence was uh, present in moss, and this moss is a model organism. It's a physcometrial patterns, which has been renamed as a physcometrium. So we use this uh, model system. We uh, got the material from uh, US, and we got the sequence of PPDHN A, which showed that it is having different, um, different sequence, different segments which are present. And so, this MOS is something unique. Uh, it is tolerant to dehydration, it is tolerant to salinity, low temperature, and osmotic stress. It's a single layer thick organism. And even if, to, even if it uh, even if, uh, if it is uh, 90 to 95% water stress is, uh, their water loss is uh, achieved by this uh, single layer thick organism. So single layer thick organism with uh, is the physcometrial patterns is highly advanced, having a highly advanced resurrection ability. And this MOS is uh, what we have uh, in our system showed that this, uh, when we, when it was shown by another group that when PPDHNA was deleted or knocked out, that uh, it uh, fails to get its resurrection ability. Now, we scanned the sequence and we found that there is another surprise, that this alpha, heli alpha helical, amphipathic alpha helical segment was repeated several times in the whole protein sequence. Believe me, this proteins, uh, same amino acid sequence, almost the same amino acid sequence is coming up uh, 11 times in the same protein. And that was uh, really something that uh, plant would not do uh, to synthesize such a big protein at a, such a critical juncture. And it was uh, 
uh, we thought that there is something that might be involved in this system. And we looked into and found that this is the amphipathic alpha helix which is forming in, the, in these segments, these green segments. And this, this is a hydrophobic region, this is a hydrophilic region, and uh, like the K segment, the same structure is obtained in this D segments which we did named. So we found that this, what is this so many alpha helical segments is doing in this particular protein? So we made a hypothesis that this must be, uh, this must be the, okay. So this must be the uh, alpha helical segments, 11 alpha helical segments as well as the K segment and this is forming a barrel like structure such that it can protect a, dis uh, protect a misfolded protein by just when it comes and the exposed hydrophobic ends are exposed here and they are placed inside the barrel just to protect it from um, uh, getting, uh, getting involved in uh, interaction with another protein which is uh, in an ordered structure. So this model, uh, we are working on this to prove it and we generated deletion mutants again in this particular uh, PPDHNA protein to find out what it actually does. So we f saw, we saw that when there is a full length PPDHNA protein and we generate a deletion mutants, so Y6D6, if you can read here, Y6D6 is one protein which is, uh, there are six uh, D segments and similarly we created another mutant which has been shuffled, the, so keeping the same amino acid sequence in the protein. And the alpha helical segments were disrupted in this case. Alpha helical segments disrupted in this project. So Y6D6 is having the normal uh, alpha helical segments and Y6DM6 is uh, not having the alpha helical segments. And we did CD spectroscopy and NMR to just confirm that there is a change in the, the it is not, um, um, the structure is not um, forming in this uh, mutated D segments. So then we were sure that these segments were able to adopt the alpha helical structure, whereas the propensity for forming the alpha helical structure was compromised in the shuffled mutants. So when we got this, we uh, looked at the activity of the protein in protection, protecting an enzyme which is uh, uh, thermolabile, and we saw that Y6DM6 is the least protecting uh, protein in the whole uh, set of deletion mutants. So we uh, did some aggregation experiments to find out if there is a aggregation. So yeah, we, the least aggregation is found in the full length protein, whereas the, in Y6DM6 you see greater amount of aggregations and when the protein size is uh, the smallest, there is a lot of aggregations. But when there is a, a K segment, there are still some aggregations because only one K segment is there. So we believe that anti-aggregation property exhibited by PPDHNA and its deletion mutant proteins is directly proportional to the number of the D segments. Okay, yeah. So we uh, integrated the uh, uh, dehydrogen sequence PPDHNA into the plant system and we, what I would like to focus is only this panel where the same size of the amino acid is present in Y6D6 and Y6DM6. You see the recovery status of this particular plant which has been transformed with, with Y6DM6 where there is a, a disruption in the alpha helical segments and the plant with Y6D6 is uh, recovering and happy. So, Similarly, when there is a Y1 uh, present, the, you can see the uh, damage created by the uh, stress. So we measured the different parameters. I'm not going into the parameters, just to show, say that the, it is as expected as, we want, uh, as uh, it was. And we, we then go, went for aggregation assay, protein aggregation assay, to find out that there is a 
uh, least amount of aggregation in the case of in the case of this PPDHNA, whereas in Y6 DM6 uh, there is more. And similarly, uh, aggregation assays said the same thing. So whether the dehydrin molecules interact with each other, we was our next question, and we saw that yes, it interacted. And when there is a disruption in the Y6 uh, disruption in the alpha helix that um, protein molecules were not able to um, interact and there was no sig YP signal over here. Similarly, in case of Y1 where there is uh, only the Y segment is present and no K segment, so similarly no YP signal was generated over here and this led to the conclusion that alpha helical segments are actually responsible for interactions. So, this uh, in the stress condition, so you see a large amount of fluorescence uh, uh, is uh, appearing. That means that Y6D6, which is a protein having the uh, all the D segments present, it's uh, interacting and there is a lot of interactions, whereas Y6DM6, there is no interactions leading to uh, believe uh, that dehydrins interact with one another by amphipathical alpha helix under stress condition to protect, uh, to provide the protection. And similarly, we have three more dehydrins. We have three more dehydrins in uh, physicometrial patterns, but you know, with great power comes great responsibility. So PPDHNA is having the least amount of transcript but still can function because with the la last um, big amount of D segments which is forming the alpha helical segments, it is uh, able to protect even if the transcripts are very low in this case. Whereas PPDH and B is having greater transcripts level uh, and the LDH protection also showed that PPDH and A is able to protect the uh, LDH uh, better in a way. So we uh, generated uh, stress condition, under stress condition, we saw, saw that PPDH and F uh, plants were better compared to PPDH and B and C, which uh, PPDH and C showed some kind of extra activities, uh, antimicrobial activity, whatever. So, another one, just uh, slide, one uh, 30 seconds more, and I will be done. So, that um, another thing what we started with is uh, there are three things. One is the proteins, one is the sugars, and another is the antioxidants. So these three in combination might help the plants to survive better. So that is what we thought of and we wrote a project and we got that, we are working on that, and this is the second player which we, uh, which where we see that raffinosynthesis uh, stachyosynthesis and there is this uh, actually gets sub-regulated uh, and there is a lot of protection given by the these sugars in the uh, to dehydrin itself and I have not incorporated those uh, figures but take my word that dehydrins are protected by the sugars and then also we have the anthocyanins coming up in action to just scavenge the secondary stress that is present, which actually scavenges the reactive oxygen species so well that a lot of uh, uh, reactive oxygen species are uh, ameliorated. And in that case, we took up black rice and white rice where the, there is a uh, difference in the anthocyanin content in a particular kind of anthocyanin, the cyanurin 3 glycoside. So we saw that in white rice there it was absent, in black rice it was present and we uh, were looking at the different genes and their transcription factors which are present in this particular uh, pathway and we published that in first part uh, we, are work, we have worked with the MEEP transcription factors and we have published that in physiology of plantarum and that's all. And Without this, it would be uh, incomplete. So they are the base of my lab members. So you can find Tanushri here, Tanmoy. He is a CSRRA. She is also a CSRRA. 
and Gauranga has moved on to uh, Ganga Paz lab and will be moving out again. So uh, Arup is uh, outside in Australia, Chandrima is uh, in US and Shuddhanjali is uh, in uh, touch but working with me somehow. So uh, these are my fundings and last but not, but not the least, my OPI collaborator and guide, Professor Unlaidi Mojindar and my collaborators uh, Gautam Basu and Ongshuman Bhakti. So thank you all. Thank you for your patience here. So excellent presentation, Sudipto. Thank you for your nice and novel work. So now it is open. I know that everybody is really getting hungry, but still uh, two, three questions and comments. Thank you, Sudipto, for a very nice uh, lecture. Yeah, thank you. And uh, luckily, Sudipto was my student during uh, his MSc and working very nice work in my department. I know from right from the morning to late night. Just uh, I have a query, it's interesting, yeah. that this protein is very good and uh, you showed nicely their work and all. What are, is there any record from cyanobacteria and green algae, this dehydrin? Yeah, uh, dehydrins are present ubiquitously throughout the plant kingdom. Yeah. For uh, algae, it is also present mm -hmm. and also in the Bryophytes. Bryophytes you have shown. You have shown. Uh -huh. And also there is, uh, there is another resurrection plant, the Tortula, Tortula. where there is a, uh, that uh, it survives even in, um, within one day it uh, comes up uh, alive. So it is also having a dehydrine uh, variety like uh, PPDHNA. It, the same kind of D segments are present, same kind of sequence is present and it grows well. So. In Actually, present uh, in algae and in bryophytes and in gymnosperm and angiosperm, you have uh, ubiquitously distributed. And uh, my, my co interest is because cyanobacteria are more heat stable. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, is there any report regarding the structure of dehydrin gene in cyanobacteria and chlorophyta? When a chlorophyta is very similar to your bryophyte. Yeah, the sequence structural is present, uh, but, uh, difference. Uh, structural difference because this is intrinsically disordered protein. Yeah. So you don't get a full uh, structure as such. It's yeah. a disordered structure. It takes up structure when there is a stress. Yeah, yeah. Because you know the uh, it is a very complicated one and very interesting also. That's why I'm thinking that during evol evolution, cyanobacteria was engulfed to green algae. So which dehydrin is coming active? During evolution, is yeah, there any? Yeah, that uh, phylogenetic studies yeah. will uh, help us in decoding that. Yeah, yeah. We can do that uh, sometime. Yeah. Because uh, from e prokaryotes and eukaryotes, so the which dehydrin gene is ultimately coming on the uh, land? That is my point of interest. Um, yeah, we can see that uh, which one is from the prokaryotes, which one if there yeah, is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because uh, most mm, thermostable is cyanobacteria more, but green algae are not. But it is there. Hmm. So maybe it is coming from that line. That was my question. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. It's good work. Sorry for holding the line. So I have just uh, one query. Yeah. You tried uh, uh, expressing this uh, dehydrogen glycine uh, mutant in the moss itself. No. Which can be transformed easily, I guess. Uh, transformation is easy, but uh, I have not uh, generated the uh, MOS dehydration, uh, de uh, deletion mutants in the MOS and transformed it in uh, physcometrilla. Uh, but uh, another group have already knocked it out and showed that if it uh, is knocked out, then it uh, loses its activity. And if I am not wrong, this your Y1 mutant had even more drastic phenotype compared to the wild type during the yeah, right? Because so uh, th there is one reason, because uh, one is the amphibathic helix that is present, another is the hydrodynamic radius of the protein, which gives a, a lot of uh, um, uh, um, area where the water molecules will be sh uh, removed, and it, the, it creates a molecular shielding to, uh, uh, against other um, proteins which are present there. From the literature or your work? No, it's from the literature. So, right, thank you. Okay, 
Any any question? If there is any question, yeah, please come up. Okay. Then thank you, thank you, Dr. Shudipto, for your thank nice you. talk and just give him a hand. Thank you. So uh, from this session, it is really a, I mean, nice experience to ch chair and co-chair from uh, in behalf of chair and co-chair both. Uh, the talks were really diverse and from leaf to root and as well as from seed and all sorts of, I mean, in terms of uh, flowering to abortic stress and all, all other area they have already covered. So thank you to all the uh, speakers for their nice talk. And uh, I think we should, I mean, before. Um, thank you very much, all the four speakers in this session. and. Thank you to all the four speakers of this session and our gratitude to our chair and co-chair, uh, Professor Bhattacharya and Professor Das. So before we break for lunch, I would request our uh, chairs for this session and Professor Ashok Ranjan Thakur to kindly come up on the dais and felicitate the four speakers. So Dr. Ashish Ranjan, Dr. Sridharmaya Ganappa, Dr. Manoj Maji and Dr. Shudip Duray. Please come up on the dais. Dr. Ganappa. Dr. Gangappa. Dr. Manoj Maji. And finally, Dr. Shudip Dori. Thank you, Professor Thakur, Professor Bhattacharya, and Professor Das. So now we'll break for lunch. We'll gather back after 45 minutes. So the lunch will be held at the same spot as tea was. Yes. <laughs>